The Battle of the Chinese Farm took place during October 15 to October 17, 1973 between the Egyptian Army and the Israel Defense Forces, as part of the Yom Kippur War. It was fought in the Sinai Peninsula, north of the Great Bitter Lake and just east of the Suez Canal, near an Egyptian agricultural research station. The area was known to the Israeli military as the Chinese Farm, a misnomer resulting from the research station's use of Japanese-made equipment. Combat began when the IDF launched Operation Abire Lev, an attempt to establish a corridor to the canal, and allow bridges to be laid for a crossing. Under Abire Lev, the Israelis attacked Egyptian forces in and around the Chinese farm. Determined Egyptian resistance made progress extremely slow for the Israelis, who suffered heavy losses. The Israelis were repeatedly reinforced with armor but were unable to make much headway, only managing to seize an important crossroad on the second day. Suffering from a lack of infantry, the Israelis brought up paratroopers during the night of October 16-17. They were tasked with clearing anti-tank defenses for the armor, but they became pinned down by heavy Egyptian fire. The paratroopers drew Egyptian attention long enough for the Israelis to move bridging equipment to the canal undetected. Armored forces later extricated the paratroopers. The Egyptians attempted to restore their defenses to their initial dispositions with an armored attack on October 17. It initially succeeded, but was pushed back by Israeli counterattacks in an armored battle lasting the entire day. Seriously depleted by the continuous fighting, the Egyptians relinquished control of the routes to the canal, opening them up to the Israelis. The battle is remembered as one of the most costly and brutal battles of the war. Chapter 1 – Background On October 6, 1973, Egypt launched Operation Bada, intending to cross the Suez Canal and establish bridgeheads on the opposite bank of the Sinai Peninsula, which had been occupied by Israel since 1967. Coordinated with a Syrian assault on the Golan Heights, the crossing achieved tactical surprise and was a success. Thereafter, counterattacks by Israeli reserves were unsuccessful. By October 10, fighting along the front had come to a lull. The Egyptians dug in and hoped to wear down the Israelis by attrition, while remaining within range of their ground surface to air missiles, which provided air cover from the west bank of the canal while the Israelis focused on directing their main efforts against the Syrians in the Golan and reorganizing their battered forces. Israeli failures led to the replacement of the chief of the Israeli Southern Command, Major General Shemuel Gonan, with Haim Bar Lev, although Gonan was retained as his aide. The situation changed when Sadat, in the face of protests from his senior commanders, ordered an offensive to seize the strategic Sinai mountain passes, hoping to relieve Israeli pressure on the Syrians. The resulting offensive was ill-planned and ill-executed, culminating in heavy Egyptian losses without achieving any of its objectives. This gave the Israelis the initiative to launch a counteroffensive. On October 14, immediately following the Egyptian offensive, Israeli Chief of Staff David Elatsar presented the general outlines of a crossing operation of the Suez Canal to the Israeli cabinet in a meeting in Tel Aviv. Elatsar emphasized the military and political gains of the operation, and the expected collapse that would occur in the Egyptian forces on the east bank when their supply routes became threatened. Ilatsa received unanimous support from the cabinet. Later that day, Bar Lev headed a meeting attended by the senior and main division commanders in the Sinai Theater, Major Generals Abraham Adan, Ariel Sharon, and Kalman Margan. Barlev informed the Israeli officers of the decision to begin the crossing operation on the night of October 15-16, and assigned duties and responsibilities to the division commanders. Chapter 2 – Operation Abairi Lev According to the plan set for the Israeli crossing, Operation Abairi Halev, the designated crossing point lay near to Diversoa, at the northern end of the Great Bitter Lake on the Suez Canal. The Israelis had to open the principal route to Diversoir and secure a corridor stretching five kilometers north of the crossing site. Paratroopers and armor would then cross the canal to establish a five-kilometer deep bridgehead, after which the bridges would be laid, with at least one to be operational by the morning of October 16. 
the Israelis would then cross to the West Bank and attack south and west, with the end goal of reaching Suez, thus encircling and cutting off two Egyptian divisions on the East Bank. Southern Command allotted 24 hours for the setting up of the bridgehead and 24 hours for Israeli forces to reach Suez, with the latter expected to be under Israeli control by October 18 at the latest. It would soon be shown that the execution of Operation Stout-Hearted Men would deviate from planning and schedules and that the time frame had been highly optimistic and extremely unrealistic. Chapter 2 Section 1 Order of Battle Major General Ariel Sharon's 143rd Armored Division was given the critical tasks of opening the corridors and laying the bridges. His division included two Via Revives, 600th Armored Brigade, Colonel Amnon Reshef's 14th Armored Brigade, and the Haim Brigade commanded by Colonel Haim Erez. Major General Abraham Adan's 162nd Armored Division was tasked with crossing the canal and achieving an encirclement with its 300 tanks. The division included Colonel Nat Knir's 217th Armored Brigade, Colonel Gabi Amir's 460th Armored Brigade and I.A. Keren's 500th Armored Brigade. A paratrooper brigade would be transferred to Adan's division during the course of the battle. Kalman Margan's 252nd Armored Division would initially launch diversionary attacks elsewhere to draw attention from Sharon's operations at Diversoir. Thereafter the division would hold and secure the corridor and bridgehead. Egyptian forces in the area formed the southern flank of the 2nd Field Army. These units were the 21st Armored Division, commanded by Brigadier General Ibrahim Orabi, and the 16th Infantry Division, commanded by Brigadier General Obad Rab El Nabi Hafez. In addition to being the division commander, Hafez also commanded forces within his division's bridgehead, which included the 21st Division. Orabi's unit included the 1st Armored Brigade, under Colonel Syed Saleh, the 14th Armored Brigade, under Colonel Othman Kamel, and the 18th Mechanized Brigade, under Colonel Talot Muslim. Hafez's 16th Division included the 16th Infantry Brigade, commanded by Colonel Obad El Hamid Obad El Sami, as well as the 116th Infantry and the 3rd Mechanized Brigades. Chapter 2 Section 2 Location of Battle and Deployment of Forces Two main roads led to Diversoir. The first was the Tosatel Salam Road, codenamed Akavish by the Israelis. This road connected Artillery Road east of the canal, to Lexicon Road. The Lexicon Akavish junction fell on Tel Salam, near the Great Bitter Lake and six kilometers south of Diviawa, where Fort Lakedon was located. The second road, codenamed Tercha, ran north of Akavish. It too connected Artillery Road to Lexicon, but provided a direct route to the yard. The Lexicon Tercha junction fell on Fort Musmd. This fortification, which consisted of two strong points 500 meters apart, had been captured on October 9 by a small assault force, while Fort Lakin had been evacuated without any combat on October 8. The importance of both fortifications lay in their control of the Lexicon Akavish and Lexicon Tercha junctions. Both forts, however, were in the designated buffer zone, 35 kilometers long, between the Second and Third Armies. It was believed this area would not need defending, as it was both adjacent to the Great Bitter Lake, a natural obstacle, and most of it lay outside the range of the Egyptian Sams. Thus they were left unoccupied by the local Egyptian commander, who chose not to extend his defenses southwards. The Egyptian negligence to occupy and defend both forts would greatly assist the Israelis in Operation Stout-Hearted Men. Just north of the Lexicon Tercha Junction was the village of Al Galar. Prior to the 1967 Six-Day War, the village had been the site of an agricultural project. This agricultural station incorporated several irrigation ditches and specialized Japanese-made machinery. When the Sinai came under Israeli occupation, Israeli soldiers saw the kanji characters on the equipment and labeled the area as Chinese farm on military maps. Just north and northwest of Chinese farm was a hill mass known by its Israeli codename Missouri. During Operation Bada, 
Al Gala and the Chinese farm fell within the designated bridgehead of the 16th Infantry Division. Obed El Hamid's 16th Infantry Brigade occupied and defended these locations. After partaking in the initial canal crossing, the brigade, along with the rest of the division, faced an attack by Raviv's brigade on October 9. The Israelis achieved some initial gains, but were repelled by the end of the day. Also located within 16th Division's bridgehead, as of October 13, was the 21st Armored Division. Its units were positioned in the center and the north of the bridgehead. The 14th Brigade had been involved in the crossing and, along with the 1st Brigade, participated in the Egyptian offensive on October 14, as a result, it had lost half of its operational tank strength. In the aftermath, Orabi's efforts to reorganize and replace armored losses were hampered by frequent artillery barrages and air strikes. On October 15, there were 136 tanks in the Egyptian bridgehead, unevenly split among Orabi's brigades, 66 with the 1st Armored Brigade, 39 with the 14th Armored Brigade, and 31 in the 18th Mechanized Brigade. Despite their heavy losses, the Egyptian forces in the bridgehead outnumbered Reshef's force. Early on the morning of October 15, Adan moved his division from its positions in the north to a concentration area west of Tossa in preparation for the crossing. Sharon's division had been in the central sector since its arrival at the Sinai front, along with the crossing equipment and bridges since October 13. Sharon had his headquarters in Tossa, 40 kilometers east of the canal. Chapter 2 Section 3, Israeli Plan and Initial Maneuvers After receiving his orders late on October 14 from Bar Lev, Sharon headed to his headquarters to prepare for the operation. His division incorporated Raviv's brigade, Colonel Amnon Reshef's 14th Armored Brigade, and the Haim Brigade commanded by Colonel Haim Erez. Attached to his division was the 243rd Paratrooper Brigade commanded by Colonel Danny Matt. Sharon planned for Raviv's brigade to attack from the east, diverting Egyptian attention away from Diversoir. Erez was tasked with transporting a pre-constructed roller bridge to the crossing area at Diversoir, while one of his tank battalions would be attached to the paratroopers. Colonel Reshef was given the most critical tasks of all. Accordingly, his brigade was heavily reinforced to incorporate four armored and three mechanized infantry battalions, in addition to the division's reconnaissance battalion, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Yaf Brom. His brigade would conduct a turning maneuver at 6 a.m. on October 15 south of Akarvish Road, move through the sand dunes to reach Fort Laken, before heading north to occupy Fort Mazand. Reshef's brigade would then split up to clear the Akarvish and Taita roads and seize the Chinese farm, while occupying the crossing area, and awaiting Matt's brigade. Matt's paratrooper brigade, containing an additional tank company and the armored battalion, would move southwest via Akarvish to reach Fort Mazand. From there, it would continue onto the yard and cross the canal at 11 p.m., Using rubber dinghies and rafts for the tanks. Matt's brigade began moving to Tossa at 4.30 p.m. on October 15, before turning eastwards on a Karvish. Heavy congestion on the roads made the brigade's progress very slow. A little after midnight, the brigade left a Karvish and moved westward to the yard, an area 700 meters long and 150 meters wide surrounded by protective sand walls. The site had been made long before the war. Reshef maneuvered his brigade as planned, entering into the previously discovered gap without any opposition. Leaving a combined recon and paratrooper force at the canal, he sent his tanks north and west to secure the flank of the projected crossing site and clear the Akarvish and Turcha roads from behind for the follow on bridging equipment. He seized the Lakin and Muslim fortifications without resistance. Reshef informed Sharon that the forts were under control and that a Karvish was clear. Sharon in turn informed Southern Command of these successes, sending a wave of jubilation through the Israeli commanders, delighted that the operation had begun so smoothly. Chapter 3, Rattle Matt had been informed that the crossing area and its environs were clear of Egyptian forces, but out of caution, 
ordered his tank company to deploy at the Lexicon Turcia junction to confront any Egyptian movements towards the crossing site, just 800 meters south of the crossroads. The entire company was wiped out after it was ambushed by Egyptian infantry of the 16th Brigade. The company commander was killed and most of his men were casualties, unbeknownst to Matt. Meanwhile, Israeli artillery batteries opened fire on the landing site on the West Bank, delivering around 70 tons of shells and ordnance. In fact, the opposite bank was completely clear of Egyptian troops. The crossing finally got underway at 1.35 a.m., over five hours behind schedule. By 9 a.m., 2,000 paratroopers had crossed, along with a battalion of 30 tanks. The Israelis send raiding parties attacking Egyptian SAMs on the West Bank, while securing a four-kilometer deep bridgehead without facing resistance. Tuvia Raviv's armored brigade began its diversionary attack against the 16th Division's bridgehead at 5 p.m. on October 15, striking at the bridgehead's center from the east, after a fire preparation. It was repulsed by the Egyptians, as had been expected, but succeeded in its purpose. When the 16th Division's southern flank came under increasing Israeli attack, the Egyptians assumed that the Israeli objective was to roll up the Second Army's right flank, not to open a corridor to the West Bank for Israeli forces to cross the canal. For the next 24 hours, this remained the general impression among Egyptian commanders, and they reacted accordingly. Had they discovered the Israelis' true intentions earlier, the Egyptians would almost certainly have been able to defeat the Israeli operation, in light of the greater strength of their forces and reserves near the Diversoir area, on the east and west banks of the Suez Canal. Chapter 3 Section 1, Lexicon Turcia Junction While the paratroopers prepared to cross, Reshef was informed that a Karvish had been closed again by Egyptian infantry units, soon after his passing. He sent one armored battalion to clear the road and committed his remaining three armored and three mechanized battalions to push northwards and secure Turcia and the Chinese farm. An infantry battalion, forming the right flank of Obed El Hamid's 16th Brigade, was in position to defend the Lexicon Turcia crossroads. Initially, Reshef sent two armored battalions northward on Lexicon. As the Israeli tanks neared the infantry battalion, they were met by heavy fire from anti-tank weapons. They lost 27 tanks during this engagement, although seven Israeli tanks managed to break through the battalion's westernmost position on Lexicon and advance northwards to al Galar. Thereafter, Obed El Hamid ordered tank hunting squads, groups of ten equipped with RPG-7 rockets and RPG-43 grenades, to deploy around al Galar and destroy those tanks that broke through, he also sent a tank company to reinforce the infantry battalion. At night, Reshef moved with his remaining forces north along the canal bank. By passing the 16th Brigade's positions, the Israelis soon found themselves in the center of a huge administrative area and vehicle park. Reshef's brigade had stumbled into the command and supply bases of the Egyptian 16th and 21st Divisions. The base was located near the canal on the assumption that it was the safest location from Israeli attacks, which was expected to come from the east, where the defenses were the strongest, not from the south, where they were the weakest. Both sides immediately opened fire, inadvertently leading to the destruction of supply trucks and SAM launchers. The Egyptians managed to organize a counterattack by units of the 21st Division, a battalion of the 14th Brigade and a battalion of the 18th Brigade. The tanks repelled the Israelis, who sustained significant losses from vastly overwhelming opposing forces. Brigadier General Hafez, commanding the 16th Infantry Division, planned to contain the Israeli attack from the south by having the 18th Mechanized Brigade occupy defenses north of the Chinese farm, directly behind the 16th Infantry Brigade, but without its organic tank battalion which was designated as part of the division's reserve. The 1st Armored Brigade moved southward to occupy positions between Lateral Road and the canal on the right flank of the 18th Brigade. Upon the brigade's arrival, it engaged Israeli armor from Reshef's brigade in Al-Galar, Egyptian armor destroyed around 15 tanks and several half-tracks. At around 1 p.m., Sorties of Egyptian Su-7s destroyed many Israeli tanks in ground attack missions over Al-Gala village. 
The 1st Brigade countered a flanking attempt on its left at 2 p.m. by a tank battalion, thwarting the attack and destroying 10 tanks. During its engagements on October 16, the 21st Division managed to destroy over 50 Israeli tanks and APCs, while subjected to frequent Israeli air strikes and artillery barrages. The 1st Brigade accounted for most of the kills, while suffering fewer losses. Meanwhile, one of Reshef's mechanized battalions, commanded by Major Nathan Shanari, was reinforced with company sized remnants of the 40th Tank Battalion, now commanded by Captain Gideon Giladi after the previous battalion commander had been wounded. Shanari was ordered to seize the Lexicon Turcher Junction. He sent the tank company ahead first, which initially reported no Egyptian units. Shanari dispatched an infantry unit in six half tracks to the junction. Upon reaching it, they discovered that the tank company had already been destroyed and Giladi killed. Soon the vehicles began came under heavy fire, stopping their advance. The unit commander reported casualties, and Shanari ordered the remainder of his battalion to aid the pinned down men. Attempts to rescue the infantry failed, and the Egyptian battalion defending the junction directed heavy firepower against the area, aided by the brigade's artillery. The Egyptian defenders had managed to catch the Israelis in a prepared killing zone. Shanari, whose troops lacked cover and were threatened with annihilation, regrouped some of his forces and managed to escape the area in vehicles, but the infantry half-track unit first sent to the crossroads remained pinned down. Reshef sent another tank company to rescue the infantrymen. The tanks advanced towards the Chinese farm from the south. As they neared the farm and the village, a downpour of anti-tank and artillery fire forced the company to retreat. Nathan kept pleading with Reese to send additional support, unaware he was facing superior Egyptian forces after entering the administrative bases of the Egyptian 16th and 21st Divisions. With no help coming, the unit commander had his men carry the wounded and attempted to leave the battlefield, tasking two sections of heavy machine guns with providing cover to the force. As the Israelis slowly made their way back to their lines, a group of Egyptian tanks intercepted and wiped out the Israeli force. Despite the debacle, Reshef remained determined to seize the junction, giving the task to the division's reconnaissance battalion attached to his brigade. To achieve surprise, the battalion maneuvered to attack at 3 a.m. from the west as the Egyptians were preparing for further attacks from the south and east. As the Israelis attacked, Lieutenant Colonel Brom was killed barely 30 meters from Egyptian positions, disrupting his battalion's assault. The Israelis sustained losses, but managed to retreat. Soon after, a tank company attacked the crossroads at 4 a.m. on October 16, but also withdrew after losing three tanks. By 4 a.m. on October 16, Reshef's brigade, which had begun the operation with 97 tanks, had lost 56 in just 12 hours of fighting, leaving only 41 remaining. Although seizing the crossing site had been accomplished easily, stiff resistance had prevented Reshef from achieving his remaining objectives, namely opening the routes to the canal and securing a corridor. Reshef's force would further drop to just 27 tanks by noon. As a whole, Sharon's division suffered some 300 killed and 1,000 wounded that night. To help Reshef secure the corridor, Sharon supplied him with two tank battalions by 6 p.m., propping his numbers up to 81 tanks. Hearing reports of the heavy fighting taking place between the junction and the Chinese farm, Dayan suggested withdrawing Matt's brigade and cancelling the operation. He voiced concerns that the paratroopers were threatened with annihilation and noted that all attempts to open a corridor for the bridges had failed. Gonan rejected the suggestion, stating that, if we knew in advance this was going to happen we would not have started the crossing operation, but now that we have crossed then let us follow through to the bitter end. Barlev concurred with Gonan, and Dayan decided not to press his suggestion. At around 6 a.m., Golda Meir telephoned Dayan to inquire about the situation. Dayan informed her that the bridges had not yet been laid and that the Egyptians had closed the routes leading to Devirwar. He also stated there were high hopes that Egyptian resistance would be overcome and that the bridges would be laid during the morning. 
Diane also told her that Matt's paratrooper brigade had crossed to the West Bank without encountering resistance and that Southern Command, as yet, had no intentions of withdrawing the brigade, even if the bridge laying was delayed. Shortly after dawn, Reshef conducted a reconnaissance of the battlefield from a hilltop. He saw that the Egyptians had set up a strong blocking position defending the junction, composed of Egyptian tanks situated in hull-down positions and infantrymen in foxholes and the now dry irrigation ditches of the Chinese farm. The infantry were from the 16th Brigade's right flank battalion, and had the support of recoilless rifles, RPG-7s, and some manually guided AT-3 Saga missiles. Reshef discovered that the Egyptians had mined both sides of Lexicon Road, to which he had lost several of his tanks. Reshef decided to change tactics. He personally commanded the 40th Armored Battalions, after reinforcing it with tanks salvaged and repaired from the previous night's fighting, and maneuvered to attack from the west, from the direction of the canal, hitting Egyptian positions in the flank, while a tank company and an infantry company attacked from south to north. Reshef's forces engaged the Egyptians from long range, picking off defensive positions from afar, while using alternate fire and movement to advance to the crossroads. The defending infantry battalion, exhausted by continuous fighting and suffering from a severe lack of ammunition, soon withdrew allowing the Israelis to at last seize the junction. In the meantime, other difficulties were surfacing. Sharon reported to Southern Command that one section of the roller bridge, being towed by Erez's brigade, had been damaged and that the engineers needed a few hours to repair it. He also requested additional forces to help secure the corridor, noting the stiff resistance facing Reshef's brigade. Sharon's report prompted Barlev to alert Adan to prepare to open the corridor with his division. Sharon argued for Adan's division to cross the canal on rafts and to proceed with Operation Abire Lev without waiting for the bridges. Both Gonan and Barlev rejected Sharon's suggestion since, without a secure corridor to the canal, Israeli forces on the west bank would be threatened with encirclement. Subsequently, Barlev ordered that no more Israeli forces or equipment would cross to the west bank until the bridges had been laid dot after receiving reinforcements. Reshef focused on clearing the Turcher Road. He left a battalion of around 30 tanks between the junction and the western part of the Chinese farm, and prepared to attack with two armored battalions provided by Sharon. He concentrated on the section of the Turcher Road defended by an Egyptian battalion forming the left flank of the 16th Infantry Brigade. One of Reshef's battalions attacked from the northeast, the other from the west. The Egyptian battalion managed, to halt the advance, aided by fire from tanks and anti-tank weapons on the slopes of Missouri, a hill northwest of the Chinese farm, causing Reshef to break off his attack. This last attempt left Reshef's brigade in a desperate situation. He had 27 tanks remaining and was running short on ammunition and supplies. Reshef requested authorization from Sharon to withdraw his brigade to Fort Lake and to regroup his forces and regain combat effectiveness. Chapter 3 Section 2 Israeli Reinforcement The unexpected Egyptian resistance forced Israeli Southern Command to change its plans. Visiting Adan's advance command post, Gonan noted that Sharon has disappointed us and handed Adan the task of moving the pontoon bridge to the canal. Adan was to prepare to clear the Akavish and Turcher roads to deploy the bridges. Gonan informed Sharon of Adan's new orders and tasked Sharon with capturing the Chinese farm and Egyptian positions near the farm and the canal. Needing to regroup his forces, Sharon suggested that he capture the farm once Adan had cleared the routes to the canal, and Gonan consented. In a later meeting with Dayan and Bar Lev, Gonan reiterated the latter's statement that no more forces would cross until the bridges had been laid, and added that, should the situation worsen, the paratroopers could be withdrawn. The 162nd Division, concentrated south of Tossa, had been standing by to cross the canal since dawn on October 16. The division advanced towards the canal, but movement was hampered by the massive traffic jams on the roads leading to the canal. When Adan realized that Akavish was closed, he ordered a tank battalion to make a turning maneuver through the desert to reach Diversoir. When it arrived, 
Sharon contacted Adan, explaining Reshef's difficult situation, and requested that the battalion be placed under his command. Adan accepted, and Sharon in turn authorized Reshef's request to pull back and regroup, replacing his brigade with the tank battalion. After receiving his new orders, Adan moved his division to occupy a series of positions opposite Obad El Hamid's 16th Brigade. One of Adan's armored brigades had been placed as a reserve force under Southern Command. Obad El Hamid's left flank infantry battalion, blocking Turcha, repelled Israeli tanks attacking westwards and thwarted Adan's efforts to clear the road. Adan realized that, without infantry support, breaking through the Egyptian positions would prove costly. However, at 2 p.m., Southern Command notified Adan that he would soon receive the 35th Paratrooper Brigade, which had been transported by helicopters from Ras Sudar on the Gulf of Suez to refit him 80 kilometers east of the canal. The brigade made its way to the canal in buses and was greatly delayed by the traffic on a Karvish road. Adan had expected the unit to arrive well before dusk, but the brigade commander, Colonel Uzi Ayeri, only arrived at 10 p.m. The rest of his brigade soon arrived, transported by helicopters after the buses had come to a complete standstill. Chapter 3 Section 3 Paratrooper Effort Adan met Yairi at Adan's former command post. Adan briefly explained the situation and, in a short discussion, Yairi laid out his plan. He was tasked with clearing a Karvish, and Turcha. At 11.30 p.m., the paratroopers began moving, with a battalion under Lieutenant Colonel Yitzhak Mordechai spearheading the advance. Yairi, acting with a sense of urgency, had decided to go into action without awaiting sufficient intelligence, or performing adequate reconnaissance on Egyptian defenses. His unit lacked artillery observers and, rather than wait for one to arrive, it was agreed the paratroopers would request fire support of the 162nd Division's command net. The brigade was acting without armor support. After some time, Mordechai's battalion had reached an area where Turcher and the Karvish were closest, the distance between them no wider than two kilometers. At around 2.45 a.m., they came into contact with Obad El Hamid's left flank battalion, positioned around Turcher. The battalion directed effective artillery fire against the paratroopers, who were also receiving heavy machine gun and small arms fire from entrenched Egyptian infantry. The paratroopers attempted to assault the machine gun positions, in places advancing to within a few meters of Egyptian lines. The paratrooper companies spread out, but repeatedly failed to reach the defenses. Israeli artillery fire was ineffective. Egyptian infantry were able to suppress the paratroopers' movement and thwart flanking attempts. Most company and platoon commanders were killed or wounded. Adan ordered Yairi to narrow his brigade's front and focus on clearing a Karvish instead, but the lead paratrooper battalion was under such heavy fire that it was impossible to maneuver. Dot with dawn nearing, Adan realized that if the pontoon bridge could not be brought to the canal during the few remaining hours of dark, an entire day would pass without a bridge being laid across the canal, and in daylight, the paratroopers would sustain more casualties. He sent a half-track company to reconnoiter a Karvish at three o'clock. Half an hour later, the company reported it, had reached the crossing site without encountering any resistance. The Egyptian battalion fighting the paratroopers had focused all their attention on the Israelis at Turcha, ignoring activity on a Karvish. Adan took a risky decision, sending the irreplaceable pontoons down a Karvish to the canal. IDF bulldozers cleared the road of wreckage and debris, and the Israelis reached Fort Lakin before turning northwards, finally reaching the crossing site. Bridge construction was started immediately by military engineers of the 143rd Division. At dawn, Yairi requested approval from Adan to withdraw his brigade, the paratroopers having thus far been unsuccessful in reaching Egyptian lines. Gonan denied the request approving only medevac for the wounded. This was countermanded after Barlev visited Adan at his command post and realized, the gravity of the paratroopers' situation. An armored battalion was tasked with covering the paratroopers, but was unable to locate them. 
The paratroopers released red smoke to pinpoint their position, but this backfired as the Egyptians also spotted the smoke, directing accurate artillery fire against them and inflicting further casualties. The tanks assaulted the defenses, but suffered losses and fell back. It became evident that withdrawal could not be accomplished in the open, APCs and half-tracks were brought up to extract the paratroopers and the wounded, all the while under fire. The Israelis finally withdrew under cover of friendly tanks. In 14 hours of almost uninterrupted combat, the paratroopers suffered heavy casualties, with some 40 to 70 killed and 100 wounded. Yairi would state that we had suffered 70 casualties because we went into action too hastily, without proper intelligence on the enemy's defenses. Armored losses sustained during the withdrawal were also heavy. Chapter 3 Section 4, Egyptian Withdrawal The Israeli armored brigades, principally those of Nir, Amir, and Raviv, continued engaging the 16th Brigade after the paratroopers were withdrawn. The Israelis concentrated air and artillery attacks against 21st Division's units from 5 am. The Egyptians estimated there were upwards of 80 Israeli tanks attacking their positions. At around 7 am on October 17, the 21st Division received orders to evict Israeli armor from the vicinity of Al Gala village and capture Fort Mazamd, as part of a larger Egyptian effort to seal the Israeli penetration and destroy the bridgehead on the West Bank. Since Orabi had the 18th Mechanized Brigade in defensive positions and stripped of its tank battalion, and the 14th Brigade defending other parts of the Egyptian bridgehead, he tasked the 1st Brigade to execute the attack with its remaining 53 tanks. At 8 am, the Egyptians conducted an air and artillery strike on the area for some 15 minutes, after which the attack commenced. Egyptian tanks managed to destroy Israeli armor near the village and reached the northern strongpoint of Fort Muslim just after 9 am in the face of heavy resistance. However, they were soon repelled by Israeli ground fire supported by air strikes. Israeli tanks then counterattacked and managed to advance significantly. The armored battle continued in a seesaw fashion until 9 p.m., by which time the 1st Brigade had restored its original lines. Meanwhile, a 5 p.m. attack by one of the 18th Brigade's mechanized infantry battalions on Al Gala failed with heavy losses, and 10 tanks were then allocated to the brigade. Israeli armor had occupied irrigation ditches around the farm and were entrenched in them, which significantly enhanced their defensive position. Egyptian attacks directed against the Israeli corridor or the bridgehead failed, with heavy losses. The 1st Brigade had just 33 tanks remaining after losing 20 tanks. This prompted 2nd Army Command to transfer a battalion of 21 tanks on October 18 from the 2nd Infantry Division to the north to reinforce the dwindling tank numbers in 16th Division's bridgehead. As the battalion moved south, a large number of Israeli aircraft attacked the formation, forcing it to undertake evasive maneuvers, turning eastwards and fanning out in the desert terrain, thereby avoiding losses. The battalion was then attached to the 21st Division. Obed El Hamid meanwhile reported the dire situation of his forces at 5.30 p.m. on October 17. The 16th Brigade had been in heavy combat for three consecutive days, ammunition was becoming scarce, and the brigade was heavily outnumbered and outgunned due to its losses, including the destruction of its artillery units. Obed El Hamid received orders from 16th Division headquarters to retreat. His brigade abandoned its Chinese farms positions and reinforced the lines of the 18th Mechanized Brigade to the north during the night of October 17-18. This finally opened the Tercha and Akarvish roads to Israeli forces, ensuring Operation Abire Lev would proceed. Missouri remained in Egyptian hands though, posing a threat to the Israeli corridor to the canal. Chapter 4, Aftermath at around 4 p.m. on October 17, the pontoon bridge had been fully assembled, opening the first Israeli bridge across the canal. The roller bridge was laid soon after at dawn on October 18, and by afternoon, Adan's division crossed to the west bank followed by Kalman Margan's division. Adan, supported by Margan, would go on to reach Suez after the failure of a United Nations ceasefire, 
thereby cutting off two infantry divisions of the Egyptian Third Field Army. Sharon also crossed with part of his division, simultaneously trying to defend and expand the Israeli corridor to the Suez Canal, as well attacking northwards on the west bank to Ismailia, in an attempt to similarly cut off the Second Army. His efforts bogged down, and he was unable to reach Ismailia, while attempts to seize critical positions and expand the Israeli corridor on the east bank saw little to no success. While ultimately an Israeli victory, the Battle of the Chinese Farm has an especially infamous legacy among Israeli participants, and it is remembered as one of the most brutal battles of the war, and for the heavy losses incurred by both the Egyptians and Israelis. After the battle had ended, Dayan visited the area of the battlefield. Reshef, who accompanied him, said, look at this valley of death. The minister, taken aback by the great destruction before him, muttered in an undertone, what you people have done here. Later, Dayan would recount that, I am no novice at war or battle scenes, but I have never seen such a sight, not in reality, or in paintings, or in the worst war movies. Here was a vast field of slaughter stretching as far as the eye could see. Sharon would also provide his own poignant account of the aftermath, it was as if a hand-to-hand -hand battle of armor had taken place. Coming close you could see the Egyptian and Jewish dead lying side by side, soldiers who had jumped from their burning tanks and died together. No picture could capture the horror of the scene, none could encompass what had happened there. The losses suffered by both the Egyptians and the Israelis in the battle were severe. Israeli units suffered heavy casualties in men and equipment, Reshef's armored losses during the first night of the battle alone were comparable to Egyptian armored losses on the disastrous October 14 offensive. For their part, the numbers of Egyptian armored forces within 16th Division's bridgehead severely dwindled. As of the 18th of October the 21st Armored Division had no more than 40 tanks remaining of an original 136 tanks available at the start of the battle, while the 16th Infantry Division had just 20 tanks remaining in its organic tank battalion. This attrition served Egypt's war strategy of inflicting maximum casualties on the Israelis, even though, from another perspective, the initiative had passed to the Israelis during the battle. Chapter 4 Section 1 Notable participants. Among the participants of the battle were Muhammad Hussein Tantawi and Ahud Barak, then lieutenant colonels. Tantawi commanded an infantry battalion under the 16th Infantry Brigade. He engaged Reshef's armor during October 16 and later Mordechai's paratroopers during the night of October 16-17, and was decorated for valor during the battle. Barak commanded an armored battalion during the battle and personally led the armored effort to extricate the Israeli paratroopers. Both men would later serve as ministers of defense in their respective nations and encounter each other again in that capacity. Another notable participant was future Israeli general and politician Yitzhak Mordechai, then an Israeli paratrooper battalion commander.